All right, it's another Wednesday morning, and I'll tell you this, I'm looking forward, of course, to seeing everybody at Bible study tonight. However, we do have another sermon to share, as we do every Wednesday morning. This message is one that I listened to, and it was preached uh, rather recently, I believe probably a couple weeks ago, by Pastor Bob Gray II, the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church down in Longview, Texas, and I thought it was an excellent truth. The sermon is titled, Unto Good Works, and I hope that you'll sit back on this Wednesday morning and enjoy it now. You know, take your Bibles, if you would, and uh, let's run to the book of Ephesians, or walk, or turn, or whatever you'd like to do. Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, Ephesians chapter number 2. I appreciate the uh, gentleman in the PA, um, Brother Parker, and Brother um, Webb, and Brother Maxwell. Uh, they truly are holding together a system uh, that is on its last leg. And uh, they, it would not shock me right now if the whole thing went out while I was preaching um, because every time we get it set, it falls apart. Um, and when the Bible says that the devil is the prince and power of the air, he truly is. And uh, those guys are truly operating by faith. Uh, we will be moving the sound booth to the very top in the balcony right there to where they can hear everything in, in the house. And uh, it, they, there's truly, I'm, I'm just going to put Hebrews 11.1 1, uh, right there. Because truly that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, so, uh, but I do appreciate those guys because uh, it's different testing the sound system uh, when this is an empty auditorium. Uh, but when this auditorium gets human bodies in it, and we hope that's the only kind of bodies that come into this auditorium, uh, the system takes a turn. Every cell phone that is on right now interferes with everything we have going on. Just to give you an idea, um, the federal government banned a certain wavelength uh, a couple of years ago, if you remember. Uh, so there's a certain bandwidth that they sold uh, to all the cell companies. And there's one particular company that had a uh, monopoly on this bandwidth. And that's why we had to uh, discontinue. We had to buy all new mics. Uh, they are getting ready uh, to sell the bandwidth that our current mics are on. Well, the problem with that is, is that hundreds of churches, thousands of churches, buy their wireless mics based on this bandwidth. So back there are all of the receivers. So between them and the wireless mics, your cell phones truly interfere. Um, and when your cell phones are on and when it's downloading data, uploading data, uh, then the frequency at some point is competing. And a lot of times we, we're just like, what is going on with the system? Uh, and so I would ask, I said all that to say this. Um, I think when we come to church, uh, the most disrespectful thing you'll ever do is be distracted from a holy God. Really. And uh, it used to be if there was an emergency that they would, you'd call the state troopers uh, and they would go to the house of God. Uh, I was out of town preaching with my father years and years ago uh, before cell phones, and, uh, and, and uh, him, he was on the front row, and in the back walked a state trooper and uh, asked the usher, where's Bob Gray Sr.? And the usher came down, got my father, took him to the state trooper, and the state trooper said, uh, your wife was just taken to the hospital. That's how you got things going. Uh, but now I think the reason that a lot of times uh, that we don't have revival in churches is because God is competing with the prince and power of the air, especially if your ball team's playing. Um, so the Cowboys are already paid yesterday, so I left my phone in the office. All right, so here we go. <laughs> So if you could help us, that would be amazing. And I'm not saying when the PA goes wrong that it's your fault. Um, I'm just saying it's your fault. So here, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of cell phones, among whom... 
among whom also we, ha- we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So understand, this is what we were before we got saved. Now, you may and I may think, especially uh, with, with myself being born in church, if that's how we want to say it, uh, born and then the very next service, my mama has me in church, um, but this is what I, I was. Y'all, I, I, I've, I've never done a lot of the things other people could give testimonies about, and that is due in big part to my mom and my dad. In fact, a huge part of how they made sure they protected me from the ills of the society. But always remember this, regardless of how, what your pedigree is or how clean you think you are and I think I am, this is what we were. Look at that. We had our walk, our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh and the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward, uh, toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me stop right there before I go any further. So what this is telling us is this is what you were before Christ, B.C., before Christ, your nature, you were a child of disobedience. Your whole conversation, your whole lifestyle was wrapped up in what the Bible says was the lust of the flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. Even when you were a child, all the trouble you got in is a result of what you were by nature. Nobody teaches their children how to do wrong. Your children will do wrong. The extent of the wrong they do is really in accordance with how much guarding you as parents put on them. Leave a child to himself, he'll bring his mother to shame. Leave a child to himself, he'll get himself in trouble. Every parent knows that when your child is quiet in the back room and you do not hear them, something's going on, right? So understand, this is what we were. So there's two bookends here. One is that this is what we were before Christ. The other is what we will be when we see Christ. Because if you look at it, he said this, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Look at this, in his kindness. Let me tell you something. God is a kind God. But you and I will not know just how kind God is until you see God And then the Bible tells us that he will show us just how kind he is. Isn't that amazing that you and I deserve no kindness before you got saved? You and I were by nature children. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air. But when he saved us because of Jesus Christ, then one day he's going to reveal to us this treasure trove of all this kindness. But if you'll notice here that he tells us, now you don't get this by your works, you get this by grace, are you saved through faith? But now we come to verse 10. This is where I want to light at tonight. We come to verse 10. Remember, before you and I, by nature, were children of of, of the devil, after we got saved, one day we'll see all the kindness that sent us his son, gave us salvation, gave us everything we have, Footnote, everything you have is not because of you. Everything you have is because of his kindness. Let that sink in. Young person, everything you have is because the God who created you is kind. Kind. Very kind. So now we come to verse number 10. So what is it that we are to do in between the time that we were and in the time that we will be 
revealed to his kindness. Look at it. For we are his, what please? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus. I want you to say this phrase. Are you ready? Unto good. That's what I want to preach on. I'm going to preach on that phrase right there. Unto good works. Heavenly Father, Lord, on this night, I'm not looking to be lengthy. I'm not looking to be short. I'm looking to be right on time with what you want tonight. It is always amazing to me how that short, temporal, temporary truths from your word yield such an eternal harvest. And I I am totally amazed that how that a 30-minute sermon, a 40-minute sermon that God, it can do such a lifetime worth of work. It's not because of the speaker. It's because of the power of your word. Lord, I pray on this night that you would give us a glimpse into your word with this little phrase, unto good works. Bless us on this night. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The beginning two phrases of Ephesians chapter 2 sums up exactly what is to occupy our time while waiting to go to heaven. It is to be good works. We are his workmanship created unto good works. This sums up why you have been left here. If Christ only wanted to save you, then as soon as you said amen, he would have redeemed you. But he has chosen not to redeem you because he has a purpose for you. Everybody's trying to find their purpose in life. Everybody's trying to find their career path. Everybody's second-guessing the choices they made in their middle age. If I had made a different choice back here career-wise, maybe I would not have ended up where I'm at. Always remember this. Whether you're in a midlife crisis of doubt about what you decided to do with your life, whether you thought you made a mistake, nobody escapes the purpose of God. And the purpose of God for leaving you here is this. You are his workmanship created unto good works. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John 10, 32, Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Acts 9, 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works. 1 Timothy 2, 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. 1 Timothy 5, 10, well reported of four good works, talking about the widows, if she had brought up children, if she had lodged stranger, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had received the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work work. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 25, likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. 1 Timothy 6 18, that they do good, that they may be rich in good works, and it qualifies it, ready to distribute, ready to communicate. 2 Timothy 3 3 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all Good works. In all things, Titus 2 7, show thyself a pattern of good works. Titus 2 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Are you catching it? Zealous of good works. Titus chapter 3 verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Titus chapter 3 verse 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good work for necessary uses uses that they be not unfruitful. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 12, having your conversation honest among Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which shall be, which shall be whole, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Your good works are not necessary to go to heaven. Your good works are not necessary to go to heaven, but your good works are necessary for other people to get to heaven. 
They are not believing in your good works. Your good work shows them a good God who has all kindness and sent his son to die on an old rugged cross. And you are to do, and I am to do, good works. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There's a story of a church that was destroyed during World War II, and nothing remained but a heap of rubble and broken glass. Church members, however miraculously, found a statue of Christ still standing erect. In spite of all the bombing, it was unharmed except that both hands were missing. The congregation began rebuilding the church facilities. One day, a sculptor saw the broken figure of Christ and offered to carve new hands. The church officials met to consider the sculptor's friendly gesture and decided not to accept the offer. Why? Because the members of that church said, quote, our broken statue reminds us that Christ has no hands to minister to the needy or feed the hungry or enrich the poor except our hands. He inspires, we serve. Some years later, someone was moved by this same story and wrote a poem, and maybe you've heard it or read it. God has no hands, but our hands to do his work today. God has no feet but our feet to lead others in his way. God has no voice but our voice to tell others how he died. God has no help but our help to lead them to his side. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Were you left here to make money? No, you were left here to do good works. Were you left here to make a legacy for yourself? No, you were left here to do good works. Were you left here to build your ministry or to build a kingdom? No, you were left here to do good works. Please take note in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, if you would observe the phrase workmanship. For we are his workmanship. The word workmanship means a product, a fabric, a thing that is made. You see, you're made in the image of God. You are the final manufacturing product in from the mind of God. You are God's intellectual property. You are God's pattern. You only have one creator. You have one owner and you have one purpose. Your purpose is not to fill your belly and fill your mind and fill your pocketbook. Your purpose, my purpose is to do good works. You are his workmanship. The next word created It simply means this, somebody molded you exactly like you. In fact, God made you an individual not to do my good works, and for me not to do your good works, God made us an individual because we were created. This is not a cookie cutter. This is not take a, take a, take a, a shape and cookie cut the dough out. No, 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 no. Everybody here has your personal DNA by God, and you are personally made by God, and you are your own individual. You are not your sibling's identity. You are not your daddy's identity. You are not your mama's identity. You're not your neighbor's identity. You are your own identity in Christ, and you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. This is very interesting because the word, the name Jesus, he qualified this Jesus by saying it's just not Jesus, it's Christ Jesus. Because you see, Joshua, the famous captain of the Israelites, his name in Hebrew is Jesus. Then you have other instances where there were other people named Jesus. Jesus. But there's only one Jesus that created you, and that is Christ Jesus. Listen, the Savior, Christ, Christo, Christ, that redeemed you. He made you. And there's a lot of people trying to fit in somebody else's shadow and fit in somebody else's path and fit in somebody else's generation. There's only one path and one generation you need to fit in, and that is the God who made you, and that is the Jesus Christ who equipped you, and you were not created to live here to do your career. You were created, I was created to be his workmanship, created unto good works. That that phrase, unto good works, means before or position. 
You see, this is very interesting. I do not go through life finding out what I am good at. I do not dabble here for five years. I need a different career change. And then I'm going to come over here and, nope, that didn't fit. I need a different career change. God's not letting you live to find out where you fit. God already knows where you fit. And that's why every word of God is so precisely and pristinely placed by an almighty author because he said, you are my workmanship created in my son unto. He's not waiting to find out what you're good at. He already knows what you're good at because you've got a creator that was good at it and he had a son that was awesome at it. He already knows what you're good at. You're supposed to be good at good works. When you were born, you were created unto good works. For this thing to say, well, you know, I'm just trying to find out where I fit in the Christian realm. You may not know where you fit in the Christian realm with your occupation or maybe your, your job down at the church, but I can tell you this, you were created unto good works. The synopsis of this thought is simple. You have been created by Jesus Christ for the purpose of good works. You cannot deny this. You cannot divorce from this. This is not a buffet of choice. This is in your DNA. Believers, listen to this. This is why you're created. And the believers who are wandering are believers who have not yet figured it out. You are not created for anything else. So you cannot deny that this is why you've been created. So the question is straightforward tonight. Are you that Christian created by Jesus Christ under good works, or are you that Christian created by Jesus Christ unto uselessness? Or is your life doing good works, or are you just useless? You see, you were created, but the unto must be adopted by you. Jesus, your creator, did not mastermind you for the purpose of just existing. Your creator created you for the purpose of leaving behind you stepping stones of good works, stepping stones that are visible, stepping stones that are definable, stepping stones that are undeniable, a trail that someone can look at and say this, that man, that lady fulfilled their purpose because I don't care how they made their money. I don't care what their titles were. I can tell you this, that Christian used every position they have been in to do good works. Let me ask you a question. Could somebody point to your life and say a good work? that you have done. I have a dear friend that for the past 20, 22 years, probably solid, has been right by my side, and that is Brother Poncho. And even when I was a youth pastor, he was my amigo. I, Lone Ranger, he tanto. And I love that man. But how many right now could say, not because at the point he did good works, he wanted the recognition, but how many right now could say, and he may fall off the wagon tonight, but how many could give testimony of a good work? Would you raise your hand? What's your legacy going to be? You see, you are not created unto uselessness. You are created unto good works. Before we go further into this book, go to Matthew chapter 5. And as I come to a close in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16, I read it in my list of scriptures that I was reading. But, but I want you to look at this because Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, the very first verse I read, look at this. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your, what please? Good works. And do what? 
glorify your Father which is in heaven. If there is a parable that best illustrates this of good works, it would be the parable of the talents. If you're there in Matthew chapter 5, would you travel to Matthew 25? Go to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to read this. We were created unto good works. These good works should be what you are all about. It should define you. If you are known for your occupation more than your good works, you have failed. If you are known more for any other identity than what you were created for, we have failed. If the only thing I'm known for is preaching the word three times a week, four times a week, and pastoring this church, and that's the only thing I'm known for, then I have failed. There should be a trail that somebody at your funeral can stand up and say this, they fulfilled why they were created. They were created unto what? Good works. And by the way, this good works is not age discriminating Teenagers, stop living a mirrored, self-filled life and do the purpose why you were created. Stop waiting to find out what you're good at and do what you were created to be good at. And that is good works. Because look here, Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave what, please? Five talents. Could I illustrate this tonight? Let me illustrate it this way by measly money. And here's five. If I could let these be the talents. He distributed unto, unto one five talents. Look at it. And to another, how much please? Two talents. I know what you're thinking. I'm going to that drawer in that pulpit right after church. And he gave the other one how many? Two and to the other one, how many did he give? One. Now, please stay with me. Why were we created? We were created unto what, please? Good works. So, please. And to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five went and traded with the same and made them what, please? Five more. So now this guy that was given five, he went and traded it, and now he has five more. And if you would, with the same, he made five. Look, and likewise, he that had received two, he also gained what? He gained another two. So now, all of a sudden, this guy that had five, he has ten, and this guy that has two, he now has four. But he that had received the one, are you with me? Went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And so the one that had won, guess what he did? He went to the earth and he took that dollar, if I could use the one talent, and you know what he did? He buried it and he hid it in the earth. Why are we created? We're created unto what, please? Good works. This parable illustrates that the first two servants, the master gave them the head start. They didn't have to go out and get the ability. They didn't have to go out and get the talents. And like you didn't have to go out and get you. You didn't have to go out and get you. You know what vainglory is? Vainglory is taking credit for something you had nothing to do with. And if you think you're good looking, you had nothing to do with it. And if your jaw lines up the straight, the right, you had nothing to do with it. And if you're the right height and the right weight, and let me pause and say, whoever makes that height weight chart is a liar, and they're anorexic, and they're skinny, is that right there? I'm going to come out with Bob's height weight chart, and it's going to change every 10 years. But I'm going to tell you right now, you and I had nothing to do with what was given us. So he went and he hid it. Look at verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received the five talents brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Look at verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And the Lord said, well done. Look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, lo, there thou hast that is thine. I find this very interesting. He didn't, according to the content, he didn't even dig it out of the earth. The other said, Lord, I just want to, I, I, this, here it is. You know what he said? It's there in the earth. You go get it. Why were we created? Unto what? I hope this becomes very convicting to every believer, myself included. We were created unto good works. This is your workmanship. This is your purpose. This is why you were created. In the bindery, and, and, and Michael, I think you would agree, I don't want to talk too much about the proprietorship of how this is done, because, but I was amazed at how the bindery, and, and when we get it up and running, which shouldn't be too much longer, and praise the Lord, God's broken through some things with the city, and I appreciate our city. You, when, you, when you tour the bindery, we'll give tours, you're going to find out that the equipment that was there was purposely made for that job. I can't take that equipment and do something else. It was custom designed for that job of putting Bibles together. And you and I, my friend, were created in the image of an almighty God. And in the image of the almighty God, he was created to be God. And his son was created to be Savior. You and I are made in that purpose-oriented image. You're only created for one thing. And that is good works. The parable is simple to understand. The five talents traded, got five more. The two talents traded, gained two more. The one talent buried, gained nothing at all. The master returns, and he has two responses. He has commendation, and he has condemnation. He has commendation, well done. But he has com condemnation, look at it, thou wicked and slothful. Now, wait a minute. You would think that if he was wicked, that he would have taken his dollar and he would have done something wicked with it. You would think that he'd be like the prodigal and he would take this dollar and he would go spend it on harlots and riotous living and at bars and taverns. You see, in our mind, we think the wicked condemnation or thou wicked and slothful servant only comes when we use this to pleasure the flesh. Uh-uh. No. What were we created unto? Good works. But when you take your life and you are useless and you bury it in the earthy and then you cover it up with the earthy, and your attitude is, I'm just waiting on the Lord's return. And when he returns, at least I didn't use this body to get drunk, and at least I didn't use this body to see things. I'm like the three monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. You will get a condemned nation. Brother Joe, isn't Matthew 25 a kingdom chapter? It is. Matthew 25 is a kingdom chapter. It has a present principle that gives us, what is the kingdom going to be like? Can anybody tell me that when they weren't good with what they were given, did they get to keep it or was it taken away and given to someone else? The same uselessness that you have right now is the same uselessness you'll have in the kingdom. Because if you're not useful to him now, 
you're saved, you're going to go to heaven, but he's going to reign one day. Did y'all hear that? He's going to reign one day. We see, we don't talk much about the kingdom. We're going to reign and rule with him. And the people right now that are like, no, sir, no, sir, you have given me and I'm going to be useful with good works. In the kingdom, in the kingdom. Created unto what, please? Good works. So my question to you is, you're not a drunk. You're not immoral. You go to work. You pay your bills. You come home. You're faithful to your wife. You're faithful to your husband. You love your children. But where are your good works? Teenager, what are you waiting on to do good works? I appreciate Jacob Hollifield. Jacob, could you stand? Where you at, Jake? Could you stand? Jacob ushers right back over here with his daddy. And Jacob, I'm going to be honest with you. I heard the other day one of our young men make a smart crack. Look at the little usher boy. You keep ushering. Let others bury their life in the earthy. And I'm not saying you're not a normal young man that needs a whooping every three minutes. Brother Hollow feels like, oh, yeah. But I'll tell you what he's done. He's, I didn't tell you to sit down. He hasn't just, I'm kidding, sit down. You know what he said? I'm not going to be useless. And do you know why we have 20-year-olds and 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds that we can't drag to Sunday night church? It's because we taught them you can't do anything until you're of age. You know what of age is? When you can stand on your own, ride on your own, fix your own hair, walk the own path. And this is where we have lost it. We think we're good because we're separated. No, no. You were created not to be separated. You were created not to sit here. You were created for good works. And this creation is what everybody here must come to grips with. May I quote a verse? I didn't memorize it, so let me read it. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. But listen to this. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Do you know what they're saying? He went about doing good. I'm a witness of this. You see, these people are still alive. Can I ask you a question? What are your good works? What are these good works? These good works. He say, Pastor, I hope right now you are so convicted about your Christianity. Because right now I'm convicted on a couple of points. And listen to this. I was not put here for me. I was not put here to blend in with the earth. I was not put here to go along to get along. I was put here to do good works. Who can accuse you? Who can outline good works? Last Sunday night, a man met me down here, and he said, Hey, Pastor, if, if you know of anybody... And, he, and, he, and I have to be very careful right now. He said, if, if you know of anybody that needs help with. Yesterday, Miss Kelly and I were out for a couple hours, and, and we were knocking doors and, and just, just loving on people. And, and we're driving down the road, and the Holy Spirit of God said, mm, that, that's why he saw you last Sunday night. And, and so trying to get this done. You want to know why? Because he... This man was like, I, I, got, I got to do good. I got to do good works. I got to do good works. So, so, so if you see anybody that needs good works, and I'm just not talking about money. If you see anybody that needs good works, I, 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 I got to do good works. Let me tell you something. This is why you were created. 
You were not created to bury. You were created to get out of the earthy and start doing the heavenly and get created unto good works. My, my son and my daughter-in-law right now, they, they are ill. And, um, and the other day, Jordan slipped and told me, he said, Dad, and he talked about a young couple in our church that brought food by. And, and, I'm, and I'm knowing what I was going to preach on, and I was like, so, so you're telling me, like, like they, they brought, no wonder this couple is phenomenal. And now their head's going to get big. You want to know why? Because they said, we're not going to sit idly by and bury our marriage in the earthy and everybody else. With, I, we're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, abounding in blessings. We're blessed coming in and going out. Well, I'm sorry. Your blessing coming in and going out ain't helping nobody being confined to the earthy. You get out of your car. You come to the house of God. You retreat back to the house, and you just close yourself in. And at least I'm just saved. You were not left here just to be saved. You were left here to do good works. You know what would cure the average rebellion and the average apathy of the average young person in this room? If you would get out and you would do good works. RG when we were gone. Brother Smith, if I hear your name one more time, do me a favor. Take him off the mass texting about what we're singing next. RG sits in this chair next to Mark Robinson. And, um, and the other, Mark, what did you say? You said you're a builder, right? You're a carpenter because why? He always nails it. <laughs> Bob the builder, can he do it? Yes, we can. I've not always been out here. I've always been in the earth somewhere. And, and, but RG sits right there. And RG gets that text, and here's what he says. We sing and looking unto Jesus, and, but the whole time we were gone, John Smith's going to be mad at me. John Smith's going to be mad at me. Mama, we're supposed to be at choir practice. John Smith's going to be mad at me. He bugs her. Mama, we're going to be late. Mama, we're going to be late. we got to go to choir practice. Can I ask you a question? Why is a special needs kid I got it to where he's not supposed to bury it? He's supposed to live his life for good works, but some of you can't. Let's just get honest. Oh, but you're good. You don't fight. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't chew. You don't run with those that do. Throwback. And let me tell you something. <laughs> but what good is it to be at, where are your good works? I'm going to tell you the funniest thing that has happened to me in the last couple of weeks. Are you translating, Miss, Miss Doster? You, you and I have to admit, where's Emily at? Emily, we have to admit this is the funniest thing that has ever happened in our church. Tangina comes to see me. She'll, she'll, she's deaf. So she'll come down here and, and she will try to talk to me. And I'm like, I need Emily, Miss Doster. I need somebody to come interpret. She, she, she's crying. And, 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 and Tangina was, was just crying Am I right, Tangina? Am I right? What are you, what are you doing? Okay. Okay, yes. And uh, she's crying, and so she tells me what she wants to do. And I'm like, Emily, say that again. She tells me, and I look at her and I go, um, um, okay. So we talk about the one week. The next week... She is standing right here. She's crying, like right here. I'm over there, and she's crying. Do you know what she told me the week before? I want to play the flute in the orchestra. She's deaf. I'm like, okay, do you know how to play the flute? Can you hear the flute? <laughs> you want to play the flute? And I was like, okay, this morning she met me. When can I play the flute? 
And I said, Tangina, through interpreter, I said, you have to come six weeks at 4.30 to choir, to orchestra practice, and then we'll let you play on the seventh week in the orchestra. You can hear, you have a talent, but you're useless. Why are the special needs people in our church doing more good works than the whole people in our church? Here's why. They that are whole need not a physician. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to provoke you unto good works. Ladies and gentlemen, your life and my life is no earthly good until we realize we got to get this. I hope it's still in here. We got to get this out of here and get rid of the earthly and say, man, that broke better than what I thought it did. <laughs> Brother Martinez, I owe you a pot. Amen. And, uh, and say, it may not be much. It may not be much. But I was created under good works. I think we're done with the jocks of our society. I think we're done with, with, with the premier pretties of our society. I think we're done with the flash and the bling and how does this look and how does this fit and I just look good. I think we're done with that. If your life doesn't have any good works to back up your salvation and what the Lord has done in your life, you listen to me, one day you're going to meet the Savior and one day he's not going to be impressed with what you and I are. The only thing you get a commendation for is this. You took what you were given and you did the best with what you could do and you did good works this is why you were created. We're all fighting for that position. When do I get my name in lights? And when can I be up on that platform? And when can I get this done for me? No, 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 no. It's good works. 9.30 on Sunday morning. Over there with those kids. Is Ethan Metters in here? Where are you at, Ethan? Brother Metters, our children's pastor. There are some young people that are phenomenal. Because they show up going, I'm not living my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this done. I'm, I'm going to get this done. We're getting ready to be blessed on February 6th with our children from our children's churches that are going to come in here. I cannot wait. I want a miniature pulpit for these people. Because we should be done. Now, to do this, to be seen of men, we know the Bible condemns that. Who could lay at your feet? Good works. Where are your good works? I'm going to end with this verse, illustration, and then the verse, illustration. I want you to go home tonight. And I want you to go to the cabinet that holds all your coffee cups. And I want you to ooh and ah over all those coffee cups. I want you to look at how good they are and how many different states they come from and how pretty they are and how clean they are. And I want you to look at, in the bottom it says, hello, hello. Or aloha. And, uh, and I want you to look at all that. And then I want you to put it back in the cabinet. I want you to close the door. Because after all, that's why they were created. They were created to look good in a closed cabinet sitting on top of each other and all combobulated. No. The creator created that cup for coffee to go in it. And can I just get some off my chest? Not for lipstick to be stained on it. <laughs> Women, I'm glad that your lipstick will endure a hurricane. But the next time I pick up a coffee cup and there's like, how many's ever been to a restaurant and you're like, there's lipstick on my cup? I'm not complaining. I love kissing those lips of my wife. I love kissing those... <laughs> Babe, I love that lipstick on those. <laughs> but, 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 listen, listen. Go, go, go. I got to recover. Help me recover. I, you got, you, yeah, yeah. Open that cap. Look at all your coffee cups. And the next time you leave 10 coffee cups in the cabinet and on your little hangers, on your counter, 
And when you walk away, I want you to realize, is that you? Or are you the good works and are you doing what you're created to do? Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll end with this. And while you're turning there, I will collect the money. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And I want you to look at this. In a day and time when people are ditching church and they have less assembling, do you know why you're assembled here? I want you to look at it. If you keep it in its grammatical context of the structure grammatically, then you must back up to verse number 23. Verse 22 ends with a period. Verse 23 ends with a semicolon twice. This is a continuation of thought from verse 23 to the period in verse 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to what, please? Good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as, the, as you see the day approaching. One would think that we are to exhort people to get to church. No, no, no. We assemble to exhort or provoke one another to love and to what? Good works. That's why every time you ladies do a good work and work in the nursery, every time you do a good work and you decide I'm going to get up and sing in the choir, I'm going to play in the orchestra, what can I do that is good works? Not to be seen of men, but the reason we assemble is to find out where can we do good works at? But if all you do is leave your house, come to the church, and you get out of your car, come to this pew, leave before it gets done, and you retreat back to the house, and don't blame it on COVID. Come on now, don't blame your lack of good works on COVID. You were that way before COVID. And the average pastor is struggling to get people involved. But people are like, well, you know, I'm just, I, I just, you know, I, I, at least, Pastor, you should be satisfied that I'm not a drunken boozer. Really? I don't think so. I don't think so. When your pastor starts going back in his spirit is when I stop doing good works. Now, y'all straighten up your halo because everybody gets there. Do you know how I break out of? We got to get out here and do good works. And I praise the Lord for a godly wife that's like, Bob, we got to, we got to, Bob, we need to. Bob, if we don't, you know what she's doing? Let's do, let's, we got to do something. We got to do some good works. Let's get out here and do some good works. And we are being crucified because we think the only good work that somebody can do is what builds our kingdom. A good work is anything that builds the name of Christ everywhere you go. And we've got to get into this insatiable desire. I just want to do a good work. When you end your life, who's going to stand at your funeral and say, let me tell you something they did for me. And this was a good work. <laughs> I'm laughing because some of you families are so giving that somebody gave to somebody this Christmas. And, um, and I asked everybody involved in this story if I could use this because it was a domino effect. And um, somebody did something for somebody. And then when they got the blessing... They called me and said, hey, I don't need this blessing. Who can I give the blessing to? And I was like, well, give it to so-and-so. So they gave the blessing to so-and-so. So-and-so calls me and says, hey, I don't need this blessing. Who can I give the blessing to? And I said, well, give it to so-and-so. So-and-so calls me and says, hey, I don't need this blessing. Who can I give the blessing to? I said, well, give it to so-and-so. Do you know what? It ended all the way back to the original person who gave the blessing. I got tired of recommending people because I started running out of people. And when it got to the last person, they said, I know who could use this blessing. And when the person got back the original blessing, they were like, do you know that verse that says, cast thy bread upon the water and it's going to come back? It's a boomerang. And right now is the first time that six families have dawned on them are you kidding me? We just handed this off. 
Because it's called good works. It's called getting a kick out of giving more than receiving. This is why you were created. And the end will be this. Men shall see your good works, Matthew 5, and they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. You were created unto good works. Thank you.